Now our third and final keynote this morning. I'm, uh, I'm very pleased that we'll now hear from Judge Joe Harmon of the Federal Circuit Court of Australia, who is this morning will be sharing on his views on how significantly he values the role of FDR in the resolution of family law matters, which is uh, very close to our heart, I think, here in this room. Judge Harmon will speak on the theme how FDR, ADR, is integral to the individual, the community, and the administration of justice. Prior to joining the court, Joe had over 25 years worked in private practice as a lawyer and as a mediator FDRP in private and community FRC practice. Judge Harmon has also lectured in family law at the University of Western Sydney and Sydney University. Judge Harmon received a New South Wales Premier's Stop Domestic Violence Award in 2005, was a finalist for the National Children's Lawyer of the Year Award in 2010, a finalist for the Australian Human Rights Commission Law Award in 2013, and in 2015 received a Resolution Institute Award for promotion of excellence in dispute resolution. So that's um, very uh, strong credentials there, Joe. Um, Judge Harmon is presently enrolled in the PhD program at Bond University, researching the impact of confidentiality upon obtaining and presenting evidence of family violence. Outside of practice, for many years, Judge Harmon was involved in community radio, presenting programs on legal issues, as well as a long-running children's program, Dreamtime. So please help me in uh, giving a warm welcome to Judge Joe Harmon. Thank you. Yama Bawa Yama Daga. Welcome sisters, welcome brothers. Um, May I commence by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet and their seas adjoining, the Gimiu Wallabara Yidi people. As a visitor, I humbly thank them for their custodianship and stewardship of these lands and seas, their resilience and survival of practices towards them and their ancestors, practices that have brought suffering and disadvantage which continue to reverberate for, their, um, for them today, for their patience whilst they wait for us to realise our mistakes and to change our ways and to accept the invitation as the Uluru Statement from the Heart describes, to walk together towards a better future. I acknowledge the Elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that these lands always were and always will be Aboriginal land, occupied but never ceded or surrendered. In fact, sitting on my balcony this morning watching a cruise ship come in, it reminded me that in the journals of Cook from his 1770 expedition, he passed by Cairns and recorded seeing campfires and family groups. There goes the lie of terra nullius. I speak at this conference with the consent of my head of jurisdiction. However, I do not speak on behalf of the chief judge, nor on behalf of the court. Any views I express in this presentation are my own. They do not necessarily represent the views of any other judge of the court, and that they do not suggest how I would determine any case that may come before me, having the benefit of evidence and argument. But I want to take as my starting point the International Convention on the Rights of the Child. That is incorporated in its totality into the objects of the Family Law Act and binds every judge in every decision. The objects inform the way that the Act should be interpreted and applied and it guides the outcome that should be arrived at. It's worth considering the preamble to the Convention. Childhood is entitled to special care and assistance. Convinced that the family is the fundamental group of society and the natural environment for the growth and well-being of all of its members and particularly children should be afforded the necessary protection and assistance so that, can, um, so that the family can assume its full responsibilities within the community. Recognising that the child for the full and harmonious development of his or her personality should grow up in a family environment in an atmosphere of happiness, love and understanding. High sounding words but what they make clear are two things. The family is the fundamental unit of society, not the corporation, not the economy, not anything else, the family. And children should grow up in an atmosphere of happiness, love and understanding. If the International Convention is to have real meaning, then in everything we do when we work with families, from judges to FDRPs to family counsellors, our fundamental purpose should be, how do we assist this child whose parents have separated grow up in a family environment in an atmosphere of happiness, love and understanding. I'm going to refer to that as the primary purpose. That's a challenge for all of us to assist parents to become agents of change for themselves and their family, to heal and to engage in personal growth so that they can achieve that purpose. 
From the outset, I make clear that litigation and adversarial contest, no matter how committed individual judges may be to therapeutic jurisprudence, is unlikely to be conducive or to create an atmosphere of happiness, love and understanding for children. No court order can create happiness, love and understanding. It's something that can only be achieved by parents and within families. The purpose of assisting parents to create an atmosphere of happiness, love and understanding obviates against aggressive partisan advocacy. The obligation of the Family Law Act to treat the interests of the child as paramount in all that is done obviates against that partisan advocacy focused on the needs, wishes and following the instructions of parents. Lawyers are officers of the court. Their duty is the same as the court's duty, to treat as paramount a child's best interests and to guide parents towards shared mutual understanding of what their children's best interests are. The purpose of seeking to create an atmosphere of happiness, love and understanding compels facilitative dispute resolution in preference to determinative processes. Yet tragically, 170, you're 170% more likely as a parent to attend FDR if you don't have a lawyer. The purpose of seeking to create that atmosphere of peace and love and happiness and understanding compels people working with families to do what can be done to strengthen and resource families and to refrain from causing them injury or diminishing their resources. Too often, especially when proceedings have come before a court, that purpose of producing happiness, love and understanding for children is suggested, often by lawyers, to be unattainable, optimal but unrealistic. Many lawyers need to change the way they practice, to be problem solvers, to understand the consequences that the forensic address of circumstances that call for therapeutic and educative assistance are dire. I say many lawyers because not all need to change. There are some excellent practitioners who already understand these things. But as Michael Frante once sang, you can bomb the world into pieces, but you can't bomb it into peace. And accordingly, using aggressive adversarial process to seek to achieve that primary purpose of children growing up in a family with happiness and love cannot be achieved. The reality is that fractured families need repair and assistance to adjust to their new realities. They are, after all, still a family. They just look different. They have a different structure. The parents need to learn new skills, perhaps for the first time, so that they can be collaborative and cooperative within that family environment. And without that repair, the purpose is unattainable. But the realisation of that purpose, that children should grow up in a happy environment, mandates that we try and that we do things differently. There are important distinctions between FDR as a facilitative mode of dispute resolution and the court. Courts judge circumstances at a given point so that we can impose a resolution of a dispute. That means that circumstances are judged, facts are considered, and that reflects the dysfunction of the family at the time of hearing. Decisions are made accepting dysfunction and doing the best we can in light of dysfunction. Court processes and FDR can both acknowledge trauma and emotional pain of children and the, the experience of separation of their parents, but court processes don't respond therapeutically the way that FDR and other family services can. Parents and families need first aid, not to be beaten up further or to beat each other up with the assistance of others. They need scaffolding and support in changing and adapting to their newly configured family created by separation, and they need education to learn, again, perhaps for the first time, how to co-parent cooperatively. If I might use a medical analogy, I think Andrew already has, and I think it's a wonderful um, acknowledgement that the two problems exist and coexist. Separation is a legal issue, but it's also a health issue. Courts ascertain symptoms, and we treat symptoms. So if the court is the equivalent of a doctor saying, you're experiencing pain, here's a prescription for some opioids. By doing that, we deal um, with the symptoms, but we don't even seek to identify, let alone address, the underlying cause of the pain. We create a lot of addicts. They become very addicted to the cure, in this case, the opioid of litigation. The adversarial and conflictual model of dispute resolution is unnecessarily intrusive and costly and ultimately destructive, inefficient and ineffective for the vast majority of parents, not all. FDR ascertains symptoms, so it can use those symptoms diagnostically to determine and address conflict, to develop a rehabilitative plan. 
That would mean the same patient would hear, you have a fractured vertebrae, that's what's causing your pain. We need to repair that and you need to undergo some physiotherapy and exercise. For those interventions, um, medical interventions, think FDR and family counselling. The family is recognised as the fundamental of unit of society because families matter and because childhood matters. If fa it's families that create the atmosphere of happiness, love and understanding that children require. Families matter because the future health of our society depends upon it. I often joke in court, I want your children to grow up happy so they can be well adjusted, well educated, get a good job and pay taxes because I'll need, need them to do so so I can get an aged pension because I sure as hell don't get one from the court. The, sadly it is rather true. Um, we recognise that though because it's true irrespective of the composition of, a, in, of any family, whether the qualities that define that family are wealth or absence of wealth, class, culture, gender, sexuality, and importantly, whether the family is intact or separated. Whilst families are universal, their composition and their functioning is not homogenous. That is something that a litigious system that the court process is not particularly good at recognising and thus is lost to families when they don't have the available FDR. Families are systems. That fact, uh, and the fact that parents separate, need not end or change their system dramatically. As Parkinson accurately describes, marriage is dissoluble, but parenthood is indissoluble. The Ind International Convention does not distinguish between fractured and separated families, sorry, fractured and intact families. It doesn't say that these things apply only when children live in an intact family. It applies to all families. The rights of children shouldn't be determined as enlivened or defined by reference to the state of the relationship between their parents. Indeed, many families in this age do not live together at all. But in implementing the rights of the family, there is the obligation, as the preamble says, for special care and assistance. Some positive differentiation between fractured and intact families is accordingly appropriate, or as Justice Frankenfurter at the US Supreme Court had once opined, there's no greater inequality than treating as equal those who are unequal. That should apply and extend, one would think, to all families irrespective of their composition or how they come to be in this country, whether arriving by plane or by boat seeking asylum, and yet the standards are very different. Fractured families may require far greater care and assistance than intact families, in the same way that a sick person requires greater care and assistance than a healthy person. I use the medical analogies in the same fashion as Andrew, because separation is a health issue as well as a social, legal and economic issue, and failing to recognise both is false. It ascribes to the legal process powers that the legal process simply does not possess. And the forensic approach to disputes simply pathologises the dispute. When families separate, parents or other carers have to resolve arrangements. When those parents can't, they turn to the legal system. As Field and Buell have insightfully discussed, the role of the legal system and dispute resolution generally is to bring about the orderly management of disputes, a critical feature of democratic governance and a feature enabled by the rule of law. The rule of law in democracies ensures a consistently peaceful and ordered society because it puts in place a network of accessible, fair and usually open and accountable institutions and procedures that allow for citizens to address the source of their dispute and the source of their conflict. Courts deal only with disputes. When we think of that institution that assists in ensuring the peace, order and good government of society through the resolution of dispute and the quelling of controversy, we tend to think of courts. That is so notwithstanding how frequently judges express contrary views, including US Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who opined, the courts of this country should not be places where resolution of dis disputes begin. They should be places where disputes end after alternate methods of resolving disputes have been considered and tried. There are methods of resolving disputes other than courts. These methods are preferable for the vast majority of parents. Courts which exercise family law jurisdiction should best be understood as a pinnacle, not necessarily as a hierarchical apex um, to a broader institution for the address of conflict and disputes in society. And those systems should assist um, parties whether they are within or without a court process. If I might talk briefly though about our present FDR landscape. Our regime 
um, is dynamic and world leading in many ways. Australia was amongst the first, if not the first, nation to introduce a national mediation accreditation standard. Since 2008, we've had a regime of FDRP accreditation that similarly provides a professional body of FDRPs to the community, um, 6,000 or more, across four different modalities, FRCs, community-based services, legal aid models, and private FDR. One of the fundamental benefits of that accreditation scheme is consistent quality in dispute resolution. If you might excuse me for one moment, I want to just discuss my own past in FDR work. I don't do it to be self-indulgent, I do it more to explain how it is that I have come to be on this lectern, having engaged earlier in the year in a program of canvassing private FDRPs to try and obtain some information about them so that their details might be available to litigants if they wanted to pursue that course and so that they could make informed choices. At the same time as compiling those lists, I also compiled lists of the FRC and community-based services, but that's quite easy because FRCs and community-based services are very visible and make themselves so. At the end of that process, I realised just how inaccessible it was in many ways for the community to find their way to FDRPs in, a, in an easy path. And as a consequence, I wrote an article called The Field of Dreams about it, um, if nothing else, to be cathartic and get it out of my system. But amongst the judges of the Federal Circuit Court, I believe I have a fairly unique experience of having worked across all four of the modalities of ADR. I think possibly the only other judge of my court who might of is Judge Myers. In 1992, I undertook my mediation training at Bond with John Wade and Lawrence Buell, people who would be well known to all of the FDRPs in the room. And it's no coincidence that that's where I've returned in 2018 for postgraduate study. From 1993, under Jenny David and Linda Fisher, I started FDR work for legal aid. Um, a strange model of FDR in many ways, a stripped down, bastardised form of FDR, but a valuable and incredibly important model and the first legally assisted model in this country. And without it in the Parramatta Registry of the Court, there would be precious little FDR. I've worked at family relationship centres with RA. I've worked with Uniting. Um, the most enjoyable and rewarding FDR work I've ever done is with FDR, um, doing FDR with RA and Uniting. In fact, probably the most rewarding employment I've ever had. Through that, I've managed to meet people like Wayne Nugent, Lucia Batali, Tudor Rose, Dennis Farrer, to name a few, and not intending to offend any others with whom I've worked. I learnt a great deal from them. They're decent people and wonderful practitioners. That's a, but the most important part about that is that working in community-based services, I learned about multidisciplinary practice and how false and irrelevant a one-dimensional response to the needs of a family was. Being able to work in a collaborative team with family advisors, psychologists, child specialists, and FDRPs, um, including, if necessary, with legal advice put in, was far more valuable to the family, let alone the practitioners involved, than simply assuming that a three-hour session with a mediator could possibly achieve a great deal, although at times it can. Courts don't do that. Courts resolve disputes by identifying the rights of parties and providing remedies when their rights are infringed. Let's be blunt, that's what courts do. The problem with that is that family law disputes are relational. The remedy is problematic. In parenting disputes, the child's rights are paramount. The rights of the parents are irrelevant if, in fact, they exist beyond a right of due process. The remedies that we provide are blunt and limited. We can regulate the time a child spends with a parent and who makes decisions about them. The responses are one-dimensional. They're an imperfect tool to address a dispute, let alone conflict. The workability of the remedies that court imp courts impose by orders is also dependent upon the cooperation of parties and their skills and abilities to do that which is required of them to support and encourage each other as parents. Capacity building, if you will, and something that courts are incapable of doing. So FDR offers distinct advantages over litigation by focusing upon self-dependence and capacity building and increasing rather than diminishing the resilience of the family. As a process focused upon communication and cooperation, attitudinal change and strength building, FDR has clear benefits over litigation. The tragedy is that so many cases that come before the court, and for the last nine years, they're the only cases I see, 
um, haven't been to FDR, nor have they even attempted FDR. Over the last few years, I've done research about um, whether people have attended FDR before they come to court. 18% of litigants in parenting cases have attended FDR. If we factor in and filter for family violence, it drops to 11%, one in 10. If we take out the, those who attended legal aid conferencing where there's a degree of compulsion to attend, um, it drops to 3%. That's how badly our system at present is failing and the benefits that FDR has to offer are withdrawn. I'm very conscious of the ALRC's efforts um, and very excited by many of their proposals. The reality is, um, as each of the speakers preceding me have identified, family violence is a major issue in proceedings before the court, 80% of cases. It's a spectrum of allegation from lethality downwards, but it's 80% of cases. FDR has responded to that perhaps better than the court. Firstly, there are specialised legally assisted and supportive models of FDR developed by Rachel Field and others that dramatically increase the experience for victims of violence and their capacity to have agency and involvement in decision making. Courts are coercive and controlling and people are fearful of a court process. If you think for one moment of the definition of family violence in the Family Law Act, that is exactly what we are, violent. We coerce, we control, we create fear. Linda Steele describes the courts are a necessary violence. We're there when needed and nothing else is available. A great deal else is available, FDR. Secondly, FDRPs are amongst the best trained practitioners in the country at identifying, working with and risk assessing family violence. Much better trained and qualified than lawyers and dare I say, judges. In the brief time I have, I can't talk about all of the benefits of FDR. Let me race through what I consider to be probably the four most important. Firstly, self-determination. Self-determination is often dismissed as unimportant. But in the context of this presentation, I want everyone to remember that self-determination for a separated family means the family is finding their solution that will work for them rather than a solution being imposed upon them, if we might call it a solution at all in that circumstance. Whilst not all disputes have to come to the court, some do. Um, there would be few who would disagree that in cases of child abuse or a very significant experience of family violence, the court may be the appropriate starting point. But there are a great many cases for which court is not the necessary starting point, which sadly, whether it is because of um, wrong doorways or any other descriptor we give it, parties are confused, alone, misguided, um, turned away from mediation, not necessarily by mediators. But how we arrive at decisions and individu as individuals and as a community is fundamentally important, not only to the individuals, but the community. How we resolve conflict is an indication of how free and healthy our society is. And if all disputes and conflict are resolved by courts and determinative models where solutions are imposed, I would suggest we are not a particularly free or healthy society. Courts are not places of self-determination, either as to outcome or process. Parties can choose whether they file with the court or not, or at least one of them can, but that is the end of their self-determination. The judicial process is prescribed by the High Court. That may in fact create some constitutional issues for some of the matters the ALRC is talking about, but I'm sure they will propose solutions. That's what they do. But if FDR is self-determinative. You choose whether you attend. There is no compulsion. That perhaps is also one of the problems. Attendance is voluntary. The outcome is self-determined, no matter how evaluative or interventionist the FDRP may be. But why is self-determination important? Firstly, because the experts in relation to a family are the members of the family, not the court, not the family consultant who writes the report or the judge who hears the case. Separation is traumatic for parents and for their children. Therapeutic interventions, support, educative assistance may be necessary for most or all of them to help them heal from trauma to affect behavioural change and attitudinal shifts before they can enter into a child-focused agreement. Accordingly, um, multidisciplinary models that enable that work to be done before FDR are far more successful than programs that simply put people into FDR. Those assistances do not exist within the court. Secondly, FDR has the potential to produce sustainable outcomes that the court cannot. Courts are tribunals of fact. We decide at a fixed point in time what we think happened. 
and then apply the law to it. Dr. Greg Phillips, um, a Queenslander, indeed a medical anthropologist, um, describes that the fundamental flaw of the adversarial process is its search for the truth, as though that is a singular absolute thing, when in reality it is not. Truth is individual. Truth is affected by time and attitudes. Self-determination aids better coexistence of different truths, and that's particularly important in our increasingly multicultural country, where the conception of truth may vary dramatically. Thirdly, all families are different. The court is a one-size-fits-all response with settled legal principle applied to the facts of every case. Some communities may well see that as verging upon assimilationist. The bench is not particularly reflective of society in terms of its culture, class or sexual diversity. The legal principles are somewhat Anglo-normative. One need only look at a consideration of cases in the family law jurisdiction dealing with LGBTIQ families from 1976 when the Act commenced to the present to see how those attitudes began in an incredibly oppressive fashion and have slowly begun to change. Fourthly, self-determination is conducive to addressing conflict rather than just disputes. Courts deal with disputes. What is your presenting problem today? And the, the underlying cause is difficult to address, although there are some tools within the Act which perhaps could be better used in terms of coercive referral to FDR and family counselling. The second benefit is that FDR is timely. And I, let me skip whole chunks of this paper. In terms of timeliness, I want to be very clear that it, we talk a lot at the moment conflating timeliness with quickness. They're separate things. It's why they're different words. Timeliness is using the time and the amount of time necessary to do justice. Sometimes that means going very slowly. Sometimes it means quickly. But quick timeliness and quickness are not the same. The present dialogue about how do we do it quicker and cheaper, I have no interest in. I want to know how we can do it better. FDR assists in doing things better because it responds to the needs of a family and it takes the time it takes. Third benefit, cost. If I might quote Chief Justice Berger again of the US Supreme Court, traditional litigation is a mistake. For some disputes, trial will be the only means, but for many, trial by adversarial contest must in time go the way of the ancient trial by battle and blood. Our system is too costly, too painful, too destructive, too inefficient for really civilised people. That was stated 34 years ago, and here we are in this country having that dialogue yet again. The Productivity Commission report that Andrew referred to sought to affix a price tag to the cost of family law disputes. It was an astronomical and staggering figure. The FRSA made a submission to that Productivity Commission report um, pointing out the benefits of FDR and family counselling, what they had achieved and what they had yet to achieve. The reduction in filings certainly occurred fairly dramatically after 2006, but I can assure you they have returned and exceeded 2006 levels. But perhaps focusing on the financial cost, as the Productivity Commission did, misses the point. If children's best interests are paramount, if the convention requires that we focus on them growing up in a family with happiness, the cost in dollar terms is really rather immaterial. The other costs, lives put on hold, erosion of trust, inability to communicate, ultimately the cessation or severe impact upon a child's relationship with a parent or two parents is more important. The court is, in lots of ways, very much um, an exercise of total victory. Two combatants, the parents in the case, fighting over their perceptions of their child's best interests, seek to attain victory. Perhaps what we should focus on is what the Sun Tzu describes as total victory where the victory is obtained without fighting through diplomacy, persuasion and learning. As a young Macquarie University student who recently visited my court wrote in their reflection, children experience the accumulated pain, fear and worry of each of their parents in addition to their own. And Andrew had ended talking about the ALRC's work in relation to children um, and how they are impacted themselves, let alone through their parents. Fourthly, um, and perhaps the most important benefit of FDR, peace, attitude and mindfulness. Ultimately, we need to ask ourselves, what kind of society do we want to live in? Do we want to live in a society that is a macabre parody of reality TV, a cross between Survivor and Judge Joe Brown? Do we want to live in a patriarchal, authoritative society where decisions are made for us rather than by us, where a family is told what to do rather than part of the journey? 
Do we want to live in a society that trusts parents to do what is best for their children, but acknowledging they may need assistance in doing so? FDR achieves the latter. If I might end in the 14 seconds I have left with a Buddhist parable that I think summarises that issue. A fearsome samurai realises he's ageing and will soon likely die in battle. As he's killed so many, he knows he's probably going to hell, so he wants to know what that is like before he arrives, as no doubt many of us do. The samurai is told of a great monk who, can, who is wise and will be able to tell him. He finds the monk sitting cross-legged at a temple. In his full regalia, he stands before the monk and demands, tell me about heaven and hell. The monk looks up from his meditation, smiles at the samurai, and returns to his meditation. This continues over several repetitions. The samurai, increasingly angry, red, sweating, his sword drawn and held above the monk's head, screaming, I've killed many men and I will kill you if you don't tell me what hell is like. The monk again looks up, smiles, but this time says, you're there. The samurai, realising the risk that the monk took to his own life, is grateful, falls to his knees in compassion and gratitude. The monk again smiles and says, now you're in heaven. Litigation all too often is hell. FDR can't guarantee that parents do not experience hell. Ultimately, that is up to them. But it's the best chance we have. And for those who genuinely engage with FDR, and by doing so become instruments of change in their life and through themselves for their family and their children, they may just get a little glimpse of heaven. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Judge Harmon. Um, we might have time for a quick, one quick question. Um, is there a question from... Otherwise, may I ask you one? Um, can I ask you one? <laughs> um, uh, being such a passionate supporter of FDR, as you are in your, in your practice before going to the court, mm -hmm. just right, this is probably a more personal question, but I'm interested, interested in your reflection of coming from that FDR world mm -hmm. and then into the court process as a, as a judge here yeah, and, uh, and what, I guess, what those experiences of working in FDR you've you mm -hmm. brought with you to the court context. I, I think for every lawyer, they should also have done their mediation training, and I'm con conscious it's um, one of the core priestly 11 now that they do some of that. Um, because they're important skills. They teach you a different way of thinking. Lawyers think fairly dogmatically. They think in a very valuable way. Don't, please don't leave here thinking I hate lawyers. They're wonderful people. Some of them, when they do their job well, just like anybody else. Um, some of my best friends are lawyers. Um, they, but the skill set is different. Um, mediators are very good at distilling issues. Lawyers should be, but aren't always. Um, reframing is very helpful, making sure you actually understand what someone is saying to you rather than taking it on face value. Um, so I, I use those skills that I learned as a mediator and honed over 5,000 mediations every day um, in trying to work out from people what they're really wanting, trying to move them away from concrete thinking and positionality to interest-based negotiation. Yes, you tell me that's the order you want, but answer this question. Um, what needs to happen for your children to have what they need? Um, and parents are quite receptive to that. Um, those who represent them perhaps not always as much, but parents tend to get that. I'm very conscious um, Uniting ran a post-orders program through our registry which I haven't seen the evaluation of, but Linda Robinson from Uniting was telling me snippets of it, suggesting that once um, that the people that benefited most from that are people who hadn't been in the court system for too long. And once people had been in the system for five years, which isn't hard, that's really just two applications, um, that they were fairly concrete and hard to move. And I think um, that's another realisation from mediation. We, ne we need to start dealing with this now, unbundling the issues, defining the issues, working out needs and finding solutions for those things at an early stage rather than later because people do become incredibly conflict, concrete and unmovable. And once they are, um, they're hooked on the opioid that is litigation. We're their only solution. Nothing else will cure their pain. Um, we might need to conclude that. Judge Harmon, uh, first, I thank you for that really powerful address. Um, I think we've, uh, you've articulated in a very refreshing way for us <coughs> the benefits of FDR. And I think in a very um, powerful uh, and um, 
earthy and unvarnished way, you've really um, taken us back to the core principles. Like, what are, what, what are we trying to achieve and what, what's the purpose of these? I've become a very visual person. I um, went to New Orleans year ago, years ago with my then 17-year-old son and went and saw a uh, fortune teller who, who was rubbing my hand and saying, you're a very visual person, you like pornography. My, my son thought that was very funny. Um, <laughs> but photos help. They, these are two different houses not far from where I live. Um, and if you think, I'd move away from medical analogies to uh, the family as a structure, as a system because it's, if you have solid foundations to the house, you can rebuild it. Um, but if you think of what we do to that house, which has fallen into a bit of disrepair through parental discord and separation, this is what litigation does to it. By the time these parents finish the court process, that's what their house looks like. That's what we give them back and say, no, go home, live in your house. And this is what you folk have the potential to produce and we don't. Um, a house that looks rather nice, inviting, and has some potential to produce for a child the happy environment that the preamble to the International Convention suggests they deserve. Um, yes, thanks, Judge Harmon. Thank you. Please accept this gift uh, token of our appreciation. Thank you.